have seen Costa grow into a man uh, over years. So congratulations to you, uh, Costa. Especially, you did tell me that this is the inaugural AGA. So this is really a special day. Thank you to you and your team. I want to include the visiting sort of counterpart of yours from Uganda, Knowledge Shim, and others in that category. Let me acknowledge my cabinet colleagues that are here, including the Minister, Acting Minister of Information and Media, who has just spoken, and all your colleagues, including the Provincial Minister. I must acknowledge the Deputy Head of Mission, U.S. Embassy, and your colleagues in the diplomatic corps. I must also acknowledge, and the talk of Costa and his association executive, but the media owners. I spot some of you. The days I used to have time, used to have time to come to your stations, we did interact a lot. So we acknowledge you. Let me acknowledge central government workers, PSCs, rank and file, local government colleagues, mayor, chairpersons, councillors, members of parliament, media at the media function. <laughs> I recognize the media at this media function. So, and ladies and gentlemen, let me first and foremost express how privileged I feel to be the guest of honor here. It's actually the opposite of what my minister was saying, that my presence here is an expression of the commitment to the media. I actually feel privileged to have been invited to this important, um, important function. And I was figuring out what I should say, having listened to those who spoke before me, and I think I figured it out as I was seated there. Let me start by saying, media is vital, important. Forget about government first. Vital, important to any community any society, any organization, media is of vital importance. More so to a complex organization called government. We try and make government seamless through a shared vision. Yes, we try and make government seamless, sing from the same hymn sheet through policies, laws, regulations, procedures. We try and do all of that. But still, it's a big, huge animal called government. And without media with it, it's difficult even to deliver the smallest of our obligations to society, to the people who put us in public office. I came from the private sector myself. And I'm here, courtesy of the people of Zambia. I work for them. In the small room there, I was saying, one of the things that this government, our government, the New Dawn UPND government has not done well, is to commute, communicate effectively to the people of Zambia. I take responsibility, I acknowledge that, I do believe my colleagues in government, cabinet, ministers, provincial ministers, cabinet office per se, permanent secretaries, 
we can, we should, not work, no, we can't, we should work on this issue. Public media included in there. We're not communicating effectively. We're doing a lot. In three years, we've done a hell of a lot of things. Looking at where we were as an acting minister of information commented here. I was figuring out that survey, madam, deputy head of Mission US, I'm not sure the sample of that survey. This country was in a mess with regard to the media just three years, six months ago. It was a total mess. Media houses were being shut down. I got attacked myself at several media organizations. Where is Sun FM? At his media house in Dola. I only survived because I was, I'm fragile enough. Don't be deceived by my being president. I'm fragile enough. Agile enough. Huh? Fragile, agile, but agile. It's the one I'm looking for. I'm agile enough. I was able to go through the roof ceiling trap. The one you create in the roof in the olden designs to allow you to go in the ceiling if there's a leakage there. And it took one of his journalists to lead me in that point to survive. I would have never lived to become president of this country. Because down there, is that a fourth floor or uh, remind me? Third floor. On the ground there, the ruling party thugs then were discharging live ammunition and shooting people, injured people down there. First, I peeped down and said, this is a joke. It cannot be real. It was real. And then they overpowered my guys down and were coming through the staircases until his journalist said, we are going here. Come this way. Roof trap moved over there. That's what this country was. Just three years, four, five months ago. This is the truth. And I think the media must project the truth. So even when such surveys are done, maybe it depends on who is in the sample. Who was in that sample? There is no comparison to what we is obtaining now. To what it was. Post was shut down. Newspaper. Prime television was shut down. It is stage radio. So many of them. When they knows that one and that one. These are friends of mine seated in this hall because we've come a long way. So today, there's not a single media house that has been shut down because the government has invoked any draconian measure. Very conscious decision we've taken. And we, when, we, when you elected us into office, we said, we will not shut media houses. The truth is that old habits die hard. There are some members of our society that still have that lingering, you know, understanding that they can walk into a radio station and intimidate journalists. The law will catch up with them. The law will catch up them. And slowly, this thing will die out. Because it's not an event. It's a process. It's teaching people how to behave. Because they behaved like that for 10 years. It became normal. So, I just want to say to you, this government understands the importance of having the media, a serious professional media, genuine media. I know the flip side of not having a, a good media. I know that sometimes my wife used to ask me when I go home, you, do you mutate in the night and become a different animal? How come you are being called all these names in the media? I was a mason, and someone even wrote a story, a government permanent secretary wrote a story and said, I know the mason temple that HH goes to. He's a mason, a free mason. Really? 
and it was carried. The media institutions carried it. Total falsehood. Someone says, no, no, no. He's a satanist. Have you seen the color of his party? Red means his blood. They're killing people. And someone became a politician years later and adopted the same red color as their party same color. Aye, 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 aye. <laughs> now, this is the environment we had. Colleagues, honestly speaking, I'm very privileged to be here today. And I wish that I had a bit more time to listen to some of your normal sessions. Uh, and, and really, just normal sessions where you are having conversations. Because I would like to hear a few more things. So that where we can, we can remedy the issues that the media is facing. So I thought I should unpack that. Media is a very important component in society. Think of a situation where there is no credible media. Just think about it. What will be obtaining? We'll return to the days when human beings were uncivilized, didn't they? In the villages those days, someone just needed to point a finger that there is a witch and that person was gone. Death sentence. The, the media can say, what do you mean he's a witch or oh, she's a witch? If you grow, grow, grow older in a village, you must think twice whether to remain in the village or not, <laughs> right? Otherwise, you'll be, you are a witch because of your age. So really, media is critical to civility in society, to fairness, to the correct description of things. This is what you are responsible for. We are responsible. And I must say, media evolves. Today, part of your theme is resilience amid these challenges. One of the challenges is the energy crisis, just to help our Ugandan friends. I love Uganda, by the way. I used to run a firm which was called Coopers and Lyman. And I used to come to Kampala to see my friend who was running Coopers. I was running Coopers here. He was running Coopers in, uh, in Uganda called George Egadu. He must be an old man if he's still alive now. So we used to trot around with the meetings in Nairobi, in Kampala, in Port Louis, in Lusaka, in Harare, in Johannesburg, globally. So I love Uganda. This country has been in an energy surplus, in an energy surplus position for many years. This is deficit we see is occasioned by the drought, western drought in living memory. Largely. But we as a country have been sleeping on duty. We were in energy surplus but hydro and mono energy. I think this drought is a slap in the face to wake us up. To have a balanced energy mix. And I want to say to you, this government acknowledges the challenges, appreciates the challenges that the economy is facing, including the media, with regard to shortage of energy, electricity. It's actually challenging us in the area of food security as well. We want to irrigate, we don't have enough energy. Challenging us in the area of economic reconstruction which is the reason we assume public office, to reorganize the economy, to deal with the debt mountain. And I say to most Zambians, just to give you context, if we did not achieve the debt restructuring, this government, the 2025 budget of $8.3 billion, all of it was going to go to debt service next year, all of it. Here's a story for you, media. Zero. We were never going to have any excess money in the whole budget because all of it was going to go to one line called debt service. Isn't that fundamental? 
with the debt restructuring, we now have been able to save resources from that one spend into all the things you are seeing in the budget. And I hope in those things we can squeeze in cost the needs of the media. But having said that, <laughs> we still have to recover from an economic crisis. We still have to debt serve, service, right? And I think the media of all people must be very much aware, aware of these issues. But maybe we're not delivering the message ourselves to the media. The point I've acknowledged is a point of weakness already. But your government is now looking at several things. You are aware of our removal of the VAT on the solar and other energy sources. That's not enough. We have used this energy crisis to really flip the coin and find answers so we can return to energy surplus, sufficiency and surplus. Just to give you a test, maybe my colleagues who spoke this morning have covered it, or those who are coming. I know Chikwanda, my colleague, Mr. Chikwanda is here. Where are you? I saw you earlier. Johnstone? Oh, you are there. You are in safe hands. I think you will cover these issues. Of what we are doing, please take your seat, to, to, to find solutions, quick solutions to the energy crisis and help the energy mix that will be more resilient in drought and floods, given climate change damage that we're experiencing now. Just the gist, the test of it. And you can pick what you like from it. We're reforming the energy sector, long overdue reforms. The key components of that is to bring in independent power producers, private sector largely, public sector but private sector. Number two, to bring in private energy traders. Number three, number two can only be facilitated by what we've called open access to the, you talked about something very important here, my colleague from Uganda, to the energy assets. Doesn't matter who owns them. Most of them are owned by the government through ZESCO. So generators now of hydro, of thermal, of uh, clean thermal technologies, solar, call it wind, have the right through the reforms we put in place in the last three years to move power, to evacuate it from the generation point to the consumption point. So it's not stranded. Johnson can lecture on that quite a lot. So this is what this government is part of our economic reforms, Mr. President. You don't have to put a small P. In my presence, you can put even a P bigger than mine. It doesn't change who is the <laughs> Republican president, who is president of... <laughs> There's a small joke I want to give. I, I go to to the national park, I come out of the helicopter. These guys are putting a red carpet in the national park. I said, why are you doing this thing? He says, no, 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 Mr. President, this, this is a procedure, this is what we do. I said, really? Do you mean I will not be present if I don't step on the red carpet? In the mud here in the park. So certain habits we must change. So I'm quite relaxed. There's no idea I mean around here. Small P, big P, no P, just first name, no issue at all. What matters is the content, is us to deal with the uh, problems. And I want us to relax a little bit. Let's have a conversation. Let's just a conversation, we'll relax a little bit. So to allow for independent power producers to produce and be able to sell to an end customer, so open access. Because this is very important, and I'm coming to a point. The fourth point is that we are allowing for what we're calling net metering. I'm dealing with the challenge of energy, net metering in the energy, which means micro producers, 
households, micro producers can actually be able to generate power. Let's assume you consume 100 kilowatts of energy. And if you produce 150 kilowatts under our new restructuring measures in the energy sector, you should be able to put 50 kilowatts onto the grid. So you become not just self-sufficient in energy, you actually generate revenue, value, let's call it value. That's the right way to use, by putting that into the grid. Pretty good, isn't it? So I would like the media to see this as a huge opportunity. Before I leave this issue, we've also put in another measure we call power blending. Expensive source, cheaper source, you know, depending on technology you use, the material you use, you don't produce power at the same cost. It's different costs. I've been advising in the power sector in my business days. I, used, I was doing that for 20 years. Most Zambians are not aware. 20 years. So power blending, tariff. Pri tariff is just the price. Price blending. Really, these measures and a couple of others should be able to see us come out of the energy crisis much quicker than others assume or think or would like to. That's my message. Now, here is what I'm asking the media houses to do. Take the opportunity, Costa, you said something that I've been saying to many Zambians. Media is not just journalism. It's a business. It's a business. So I, I would like to encourage you guys and the PDU. I'm glad you're dealing with PDU and the PBDF. This is what this servant of yours wants you to do. Take this as an opportunity. And if I were you, I wouldn't buy a diesel generator. I would buy a solar facility with battery storage. It's green. Ultimately, it's cheaper. Remember, our import bill, fuel import bill is too high and is, is variable. Oil prices can go up. Why not go straight to solar? and with battery storage for your station, for your house. Two of them don't have to be located today. It doesn't matter where you put the generation point, at your station or at your house or at your farm. Because of these reforms, you can trade in that power that you generate. How about that? Then you can be contributing to the grid and you can move the power. Why can't the Media Owners Association come together and generate 10 megawatts and we'll give you what we call a power purchase agreement? Amongst all of you, I bet you don't consume more than two megawatts. We can do the exercise to see all the private media houses, your radio stations, your TV stations, what is the quantum of power do you produce? Hmm? Newspapers, give me a number. And I would like this to be one of the action points from this AGM who asked me to come and speak to you. And my PDU guys, where is Kuso? Is she here? Who is from PDU guys? All right. Minister of Energy, we'll pick it up once you're through with you your AGM, we look at, Zesco can assist you to look at your consumption, all of you who own media houses. And you have an opportunity to come together, even five megawatts, five megawatts will cost you $3 million because of technology. Before, it was a million dollars per megawatt. Now you can buy it at $3 million for five megawatts. And the cost will continue coming down. And you produce power. Some you consume, doesn't matter where you're located because there's net metering, right? Bulk metering at one point, if you wish. And now, what else have we done? As we sit in here, the Bank of Zambia, commercial banks are engaging. One bank is already ahead. 
Senaco is already ahead. We've asked them to put a financing instrument, my colleague from Uganda, so that we can finance things like what you need as media houses. You don't need a lot of power. Once the assessment is done, you, you find that you, maybe you need just 80 kilowatts. What else have we done? The Bank of Zambia will put a special facility to help resolve the energy crisis, which will be available to all of us, all of you, including media houses. And because it's a special facility, definitely the interest rate is important to us. So that's where I'm, I'm coming from. That's my background. So corporate finance. So we're looking at a special fund to support you, the media houses, even you as households, oil companies, water companies, uh, hospitals, critical institutions, to be able to invest in the NSA. I thought I should spend a bit more time on this. And if I were you, I would diversify my business. Because we have excessive demand now, outstripping supply, power is sold on long-term basis, you have a 10-year contract through a power purchase agreement, and you have annuity income pretty easy. The problem is that you see each other as competitors. This is the time you work as complementary people, and then you bring in a bit of equity. The rest will gear through these instruments we are bringing, and you should be good to go and switch off the diesel generators. A five megawatts, our trip to India now demonstrates that it can be delivered in three, four months. So we're not talking about a long time horizon. We're also working in the energy team that the president has put up to match the needs of the customers like yourselves in terms of quantum of power, but also who can install that. And then the money needed, you can go to the instrument I'm talking about. That's what your government is doing in that area. I'm sure you're saying, really? Yes. Why would you be surprised? Because we are not communicating properly. We chatted with one of the resource persons here. Where is she? No, he. Where are those colleagues where the quick meeting in the side room? Here? They've gone. We called, I called a Sunday meeting to address the energy issues cost. And it was never reported in the media, including the measures I'm just, some of them are, I'm indicating now. It's a failure on our part. So let me put that aside. There are solutions to the energy crisis. They should not hamper your businesses. We should not drive the nation of news because of the energy crisis. We have solutions working together. That's my message. Artificial intelligence, you covered it well. I don't want to repeat that. All I can say to you, it's an opportunity. Technology is an opportunity. But technology is also a huge threat to us as communities. Don't look at us as just government, as communities. Because you're a member of the community where you live but also as a citizen or resident of this country. So artificial intelligence must be used correctly. Like you described, even my leap movements can now be mimicked, isn't it? And my voice, hopefully they will mimic my today's voice, which is croaky because of a bit of a cold. And really, you can even break marriages, isn't it? Through artificial intelligence. And what does that do to your businesses? You can be sued if you carry a story that is incorrect, isn't it? So even you, you are under threat because of artificial intelligence. So we do hope that necessary regulation around this will be put in place, and you, the media houses, must support it. It is not gagging the media. 
But the two are different. I listen a lot myself. I hear a lot. This is gagging the media. There cannot be media freedom to commit crimes, to mimic a story that has never been produced by the, the said author. How can that be media freedom? Honestly speaking, the two are totally distinct. So I think they are more stronger experts than me to talk about. As Madame, you said, I just came from the digital forum. And we had a good session there. A very good session. Very enriching session. I'm here this afternoon and saying to you, we as media houses must be concerned about artificial intelligence as well. It could actually wipe out your businesses. One of the reasons, Costa, is that the viewership has gone down. Subscriptions have gone down. It's not just because of the government side. It is because news is coming from everywhere. I don't want to mention one platform. I may be sued eh? after I leave office. Now you can't sue me. Luckily, <laughs> you can't sue me now. <laughs> but after, I mean, it's just lies after lies. And people consume this. The young population are consuming this news 24-7, every hour. I go to bed late myself. I have a lot of work to do. Again, technology has allowed me to work from home, check my ministers, ask them to do it. They know. I, I ask them to do things at 23 hours, 24 hours. There's no time to wait to write a memo to somebody. We're behind schedule. We have to work. We have to work. We found a, a rundown economy. We have to work. Now, people are consuming news because of technology. 24-7. Before, I don't want to mention the newspaper which was there then. Everybody had to wait for the morning to buy that newspaper. Just about six, seven, eight years ago. Everybody. Today, nobody wants that newspaper. Unfortunately, it was shut down. Not in our time. If it was in our time, it would have still have been there even though it was the most critical newspaper against this individual and everyone else who was doing something else. But closure is not the solution. The technology now has brought things that we never envisaged, Costa. Consumption of news is 24-7. The Gen Zs are on their platform, 0-1 in the morning. So really, that is one of the reasons that revenues will continue going down. We have to find a solution to it. One of the solutions is to bring back genuine media institutions, respectable media institutions, trusted, professional. How do you do that? When technology moves so fast throughout the night. I think what Uganda has done, I whispered to the minister and to Costa, immediately you say that thing. I said, we need to talk to our brother from Uganda. It is not threatening media space. Illegality is illegality. Your freedoms, media, end somewhere. Someone else's media, freedom start. Illegality, criminality behind the cell phone is illegality. We need to learn from Uganda. When you stamp that thing fake, it will mean that gradually cost her genuine business houses will come back to you because they know that this is where people are going to because the genuine news is there. Then they will advertise. Simple. So let's work together. We're in this thing together. Last week, there was something running. You know, I was so busy. I've been moving a lot, doing things like where I was yesterday. Great story where we are opening a new pit, super pit in Lumana, $2 billion pit. When you look at that thing, it's mind-boggling. But most Zambians and journalists are not even aware that in the last three years, we brought investments in the mining sector alone well over $12 billion. Three years. And you, you go and look at that super pit, it's mind-boggling. Jobs. 
business opportunities. All of that stuff. But the point I'm making here is that such organizations should be able to advertise in your media platform, in your media platform, Mwenda. But we need to work together to take out fake news so that the genuine institutions can be identified, identifiable, trusted, and the business houses, including myself, in my private sector capacity, will come back to you to advertise, to support your media houses. We must work together in this area. The point I wanted to make to you a light moment is that last week there was a serious narrative running that the first lady has run away from HHS at the community house. It went. <laughs> so, so, so she asked me when I came from one of my things, she said, have you seen this? I said, ah, what do you mean? She said, I'm supposed to be in McKenna at a relative's house. And this story has been running around. I said, I didn't pay attention to it. Said, it's really it's running there. So honestly, the whole first lady of a nation, can there be an argument that she's run away from her home or not? No, no, it's true. She's run away. Then, then you don't know my household. But I just ignore those things. But someone takes it serious, isn't it? Someone. And then develops a certain opinion of HH and his wife and his family. So we all need a genuine media. So can we learn from Uganda? Action point. Media Owners Association, Ministry. I already chatted with PS. I think it's a good idea. And when we do that together, private media and government, we have a facility that vets stories in that way. It needs a technology platform, isn't it? And we invest together. But it's from there that the credibility of the media slowly will return. And then your viability. Happy to do that. What else? Why would government not take advice from the private media? or take advice to the private media. Why? Action point, Costa, Minister, can we put an action point here? There is no reason, because there are certain areas where government media is, not, is non-existent. Even for us to communicate about free education, we need to place that in the private media houses. We need to do that. CDF, Costa. Yes, I said it. Action point. We set a small team. Why is it not happening? I must tell you one of the things that frustrates me is the rigidities in government. And I don't miss my words. I get reminded, no, Mr. President, we don't do things like this in, in government. I said, really? So how do you do them? But this is why things have not been working for many years. Then, when I'm in a jovial mood, I said, we also don't do things like that in the private sector. So can we do what is right? So this is one where I really think it's long overdue to get the media, private media houses working with us in the space of CDF. So that the communities who are beneficiaries of these decisions, such as taking more resources to the local areas and the work that they do, can see that their government is working. Maybe not to their satisfaction, but we're making progress. We need the media. Ministers, PSs, acting minister, I would like an action point on here. We'll pick it up, local government minister, because uh, this, this, is, this doesn't need the president to push. We need to get this done. And it creates revenue streams. I heard what you say, Costa. Hungry media can be dangerous. But you know, guys, you shouldn't take food from anyone. You take a poison chalice. It's not a joke. You take a poison chalice. We must be strong and professional. But your government is supportive of what you have just said here today. So I suggest that part of what we should do is deliverables out of this um, AGM is to look at how government and the media, including 
public media and private media, government, private, government and government media can work with the private sector better. For what? To deliver for the people. To communicate effectively to the people. It's as simple as that. So I would like that checklist. One of the colleagues outside was telling me, ah, HH, we'll put you on a hot seat, ask you questions. Costa knows. For many years, I said to Costa, ask me any question you want. There's no hot seat if you are considering nothing. <laughs> There's no hot seat. Every seat is, is calm. It's okay. It was not hot FM. It's another colleague who says there's a hot seat we put people and they start sweating. I said, well, you have a customer who will not sweat there because it doesn't really matter the question you ask. We should be able to deal with it. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer. But on a more serious note, can we contrive a stronger partnership between the private media and the government in totality, government ministries, departments, state house, government media, in the past, Zanis used to provide the feed even into the private media. So, what's the issue? There's not always competition, guys. It's complementarity a lot of times. So, Costa, I want to say to you, the things you said there, we took note of, and other speakers, we took note of. I think let's collapse them into some sort of things that need to be done to-do list, and I am a champion of the media myself, contrary to what the media is saying. In my private sector days, I chaired the Media Trust Fund, which actually funded the creation of a number of private media houses. I was a chair. I looked at the proposals. Now that I'm sitting here, I think let's revive that alumni, that friendship, and see what we can do together to help society. We're not enemies. We're not competitors. We're complementary. No one worries about your editorial policy as long as you are telling the truth. Cost. That's the difference. In your editorial policy, you must tell the truth. The editors must tell the truth. The editors must be professional. They must be balanced. They must not break the law in the name of editorial policy. Let me be candid now. If we don't manage ourselves and mistake illegalities to mean media freedom, there will be no government on this continent. Within five, ten years, there will be a lot of governments going down. I don't want to mention names of stable democracies that are at the threat of being destroyed because of social media falsehoods. And Gen Z is rushing to the streets, kill people, burn property. How do you run a country in that environment? That is not media freedom. That's anarchy. And I want to give credit to the new British Prime Minister, Lord Stam, no, Sir Stam. You notice what social media did. Lessing immigrants as being palpable to a crime they did not commit, and part of England went into flames, lives lost. And because he's a former DPP, Director of Public Prosecution, he stamped his foot down, and I give him credit. There's a difference between media freedom and anarchy and breaking society's down. Sorry to use 6 January, the insurrections in the states, the march on the Capitol. 6 January insurrection, people used the social media to mobilize, to attack the headquarters of the world's largest democracy, the U.S. And today they are being prosecuted, and I follow, they are going to jail. 18 years, 15 years, as we sit here, they are going to jail. And that's the way it should be. No one should hide behind the media freedom to commit crimes and damage societies. But within the law, we are good to go. I'm a victim of abuse by the media myself. All the 
media houses here that have members who are grown up know that I went through hell myself. Falsehoods, it was just a nightmare. I don't want anyone else to live through that. So let's be professional, let's be responsible. We want to encourage you to be viable. We want to support you. And honestly, I go away here taking a cue that there's a lot we can do together than staying apart. We should come together, work together. And it will be good to go. And we can have a better society. Let's invest in education, media, education, curricula, free education. These are the things that we're doing. You do need good journalists that are well skilled. And I think, really, I also want to repeat what I said. Media houses must diversify. Businesses die over time, not just media. Certain businesses die over time because of demand or technological changes. We have to live up to that. If you remain static, you will die off. You just die off. I'm a farmer. I now know that I need to irrigate because I can't rely on the rain. I need to buy irrigation, technology-driven, precision irrigation, so I can remain a viable farmer. So applies to the media. I must say, I'm very grateful that you invited me here. I'm really, really feeling warm about what you're doing, Costa, and would like to see what other support we can render to yourselves. The tax incentives alone are not enough, but I think there are more fundamental things we should be doing together. But also, we'll check your submission. You said you made a submission. You dealt with who? The ministry director of who? All right. Can we, Minister Pierce, where is Tau? Can we pick their submission and get Pamela, my economic advisor, Dr. Nakamba, to have a chat with Secretary Treasury, Kulukusa? And just we look at, we are not done with the budget. It's just the first, in fact, they're in the committees now. So we can alter things if there's validity for us to do that within the limited resource assembly. I just want us to work together. You're not alone in that way. I think with these words, I would like to, not to further spoil your, your day, right? And declare your 2024 media owners annual general meeting officially open. Thank you. Another round of applause to Mr. President. He reiterated government's commitment to the media, sharing his own past experiences as something he wouldn't want anybody to go through. He highlighted the energy alternatives, acknowledging that the crisis has impacted across industry, but definitely there is an opportunity to look at some kind of relief for media owners. We should look at ourselves as complementing partners and not competitors, as we are all affected and united in this experience. Thank you to Mr. President. At this point in time, we are getting ready to unveil the new MOAS logo and launch the website, after which we will have photo sessions with uh, the head of state. There will be a format in which these photos will be taken, and I will announce the three sessions of photos that will be taken before we can allow our president to take his leave owing to other commitments. At this point in time, I am guided in terms of how the process of the unveiling of the Moore's logo. <clears throat> 